Does price affect your perception of a wine's quality? What would it be like to travel around the world in pursuit of 80 wines? That's exactly what we're going to learn from our guest who joins me live from Washington tonight. I'm Natalie McLean, editor of Canada's largest wine review site at nataliemclean.com, and you've joined us here on the Sunday Sipper Club where we gather every uh, Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern, that's Toronto, New York time, to talk to the most fascinating people in the wine world. Now, before I introduce our guest fully, I want to say welcome, everybody, and yes or no, please post in the comments below, does price affect your perception of wine. I'm going to check out over on Facebook to make sure you can see and hear us, but I would love to know, post in the comments below, does price affect your perception of wine? I think it does for a lot of us. I know it does for me, for sure. Um, Jim Clark says, hi, hello, Jim. Hello, Carl. Hey, uh, and yes, it does. Okay, great. I'm glad you are receiving us loud and clear. Um, the other thing I want to say before we get going tonight is please take a moment to share this video. Uh, Stephen Andrews says no. Beverly says yes, it does affect us. Welcome, Anne McLean. Good, A.V. All right, so take a moment to share this video because at, if you do and if you're watching the replay, you didn't have a chance to join us live, you can still get a chance to win one of our guests' signed books based on sharing this video. Also, while you're at it, please follow us. Then you'll get a live notification uh, every time we go live here on the Sunday Sipper Club. And at the end of our discussion tonight, I will be announcing the winner of last week's um, share contest, which will be a personally signed copy of Vig, uh, Vikram Vidge's cookbook, which will be pretty amazing. All right, Alan Cameron has joined us. Excellent. Thanks for the compliment on the earrings, Paul Hollander, etc. All righty, guys. So we're all good to go. Um, now, our guest this evening writes about the fascinating intersection of money, taste, and wine. He has published more than a dozen books that have won numerous awards, including The Wine Wars, Extreme Wine, Money, Taste, and Wine. It's complicated and his latest book, Around the World in 80 Wines. He is a professor emeritus of the University of Tacoma at Puget Sound in Washington, where he taught international political economy, and prior to that, he earned his PhD in economics from Purdue University. Today, he's known as the wine economist, and let me just bring him in here, and he joins me live now from Washington. Welcome, Mike Viseth, the wine economist. Well, hi, Natalie. Hi, uh, nice hi. to meet you. Thank you. Uh, fantastic. Good to have you here, Mike. And now I've just, I mean, you have such an impressive background. I've only hit the highlights. Fill in the gaps and tell us maybe something that would surprise people about you, maybe that they, they wouldn't know about you. Well, I, 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 I tell people that I lead a, I have a double identity. Uh, I'm, I'm really confused. I lead a double <laughs> life. If you, if you go on to uh, Amazon or Google, and you search for Michael V. Seth, which is the name my mother gave me, well, then you get the professor, the serious professor, the guy who writes uh, books about globalization and a series of university textbooks and so forth. And then if you go to those same places and you look for Mike V. Seth, uh, then you get me, the wine economist, the person that writes huh. books about, about wine. And, and the, uh, the difference, the split, the personality split, it was actually very intentional that uh, when I started to get into uh, writing about wine, I wanted, I didn't want to write just for professors. You know, there are a lot of academic wine economists. There's a European Wine Economists Association and American Wine Economists, and I didn't want to write just for them. I wanted to write for people in the industry, for consumers, to get lots of feedback. And through a little testing, we discovered that Michael Vizef didn't get a lot of uh, uh, of, uh, of replies and comments, people were a little intimidated by the professor. But Mike Viseth, oh yeah, no, so, <laughs> so here I am. Well, Mike, I'm glad you joined us, and Michael has retired for the evening. <laughs> That's great. Him, so. <laughs> That's excellent. All right, Mike. Um, so 
Now we we did uh, we did talk about this before when we did a shorter video, but please tell us the wine economist. How did you get that title? Well, I learned about that there was such a thing as a wine economist from a famous winemaker. It was a, a, a long a while ago uh, when my wife Sue and I were newlyweds, and it was so long ago that uh, people without a lot of money could take a budget vacation in Napa Valley. So that's what we were doing. We drove down. <laughs> From Washington State to California, and we were staying in a budget hotel and and uh, not spending a lot of money, trying not to spend a lot of money. And on the way back in the last day, we were driving up the Silverado uh, Trail, and I saw this name. And if I knew more about um, wines then, that I would have recognized that it was the name of a winery that was kind of famous for that uh, Judgment of Paris that, that had gone on ah, before. Right. But I didn't know that, so we pulled in for one last tasting and walked through the big uh, redwood doors, and there was a cellarette, and the winemaker was there. And if I'd known more about wine, I would have known that he was pretty famous, but I didn't know, so I just, you know, he poured the, pulled out the corks and poured the bottles, and he began to talk, and I was sitting there at the end of a long day of wine tasting, and I was having trouble uh, swirling without uh, spilling. So I was working on that, and asking these simple questions, and he learned that I was an economist, and suddenly, he began to ask me very serious questions. He wanted to know about uh, inflation rates because they were moving up and interest rates because they were 18, 20, 25, 30% and so forth. And it really made a difference to him because uh, he his business was involved a lot of capital investment, involved a lot of time, time for the vineyards, time for the barrel aging. Mm. He really wanted to know that when these wines were ready, would the economy be there? Would consumers be there? Would be a good situation to sell it. What was happening in the economy, the part that I knew about, would affect whether his wines, well, what, what he could do in terms of making an investment in barrel aging and so forth, or what he might have to do. And when I got back to our budget hotel in Santa Rosa that night, I sat down and said, wow, I think I just learned something. I learned that there is wine economics, uh, that the, the wine is an art and a craft and a science, but it's also a business. Absolutely, Mike. And, you know, I would just say, you know, given that vines on average take seven years to mature, if not longer, people in the wine business have to plan really for the long term. We're, we're talking seven years out. It's not like this year's sneaker style. Um, it's like decisions you make today will affect your bottom line 7, 10, 15, 20 years from now. And um, I don't know if you found this in your travels, but I think that's often why family businesses uh, do well in the wine industry. I know there's been a lot of uh, corporate, uh, you know, takeovers and so on and consolidation, but still families who look to that long term, the economics, I think, work in their favor if they are always looking at that long term vision. No, it's exactly right. In fact, one of the chapters in Around the World in 80 Wines, the chapter on Australia, uh, talks about the, uh, the unexpected importance of family businesses and, and some of the, the reasons uh, about why that might be the case. So I think you're exactly right. When you look at, at um, other industries of the same size, other global industries, they're not as dominated by family businesses as uh, the wine industry is, that's for sure. Wow, this is the most fun kind of economics I've ever encountered <laughs> economics with a glass of wine so exactly that's exactly i love that i did an mba but it was like economics was never this fun mike um all right i'd like to welcome gregory hughes who's sipping on a canadian chardonnay fermented in missouri oak interesting um, yeah. Yeah, good good cross-border uh, recognition of tonight's discussion greg um stephen andrews is logging in from the aegean sea you are always traveling stephen and drinking affordable wine Okay, and Carl Weaver, yes, price affects what I buy, but not necessarily how I judge the value of the wine. So, guys, if you're just joining us, you're here on the Sunday Sipper Club, please post in the comments below. Does price affect your perception of the quality of wine? Do you perceive a more expensive wine to be a better wine? It's okay to admit that, um, definitely. Beverly from California is drinking Claude de Pepe Pinot Noir. Okay, so, Mike, um, let's... let's uh, do a little bit of uh, background storytelling before we dive into your books, your fantastic books with the best titles ever that I've heard of. Um, let's start with maybe take us to um, 
the the worst moment of your wine career? Let's start there and then go. We'll go low, then we'll go high. No, uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Start at the bottom, huh? Well, exactly. I, I am fortunate. I haven't had any tragedies. I'm not a winemaker, so I haven't lost a vintage uh. or had something terrible like that happen. I was. Um, I think maybe the the worst personal moment. Uh, was uh, both embarrassing and painful. It was a couple of years ago, and a local group of amateur winemakers uh, decided that they would uh, host a charity event to raise money for charity. And, the good, and they asked me if I would be a wine judge. And, and I'm not a professional taster like you. I mean, they should have asked you, but, but instead they asked me. So it was great. It was an amateur <laughs> judge and amateur winemaker. And, and our team of judges, we tasted everything blind. Then we went back and, and tasted some more. And, and when we announced the, uh, the winner, for example, the, the wine we chose as the best, this was the embarrassing part, the best white wine wasn't even made out of grapes. Oh. It was made out of figs. <laughs> of what? It figs. Figs. F -I -G -S. Yeah. Oh, oh no. no. It, was, it tasted like a Malvasia or a Steinway. It was head and shoulders better than the other <laughs> wines, but it was all, you know, people looked at us like we didn't really know what we were doing. Uh, <laughs> I can imagine. But not painful. The painful part came that night <laughs> when all of us judges got horribly sick. Oh, no. None of those amateur wine making wine had some, must have had a bacterial problem. And so we all got food poisoning. And you know how you spend the night. With food poisoning. Yeah, that that's was no fun. The worst moment. Wow, that's pretty low. That's pretty low. <laughs> oh my gosh. Lori Kilmartin joins us and says, Hello, Mike, and so does Murray Johnson. Alan Cameron, this guy is good, Natalie. You're bringing so much more to my knowledge and appreciation of wine by having such wonderfully interesting guests. I would agree, Alan. He is excellent. More stories to come. That's a great story, Mike. Oh my gosh. Judging a homemade wine competition. You are a brave man. Um, I didn't know I was brave then. <laughs> okay. Anyway. <laughs> so let's go high now. What has been the highlight of your wine career so far? Oh, well, I, I mean, I've had I've had a lot of great moments. I, I really okay. am a person. Um, uh, 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 interesting, a, a book reviewer once started a review that says, everyone should be as lucky as Mike Visa. Nice. Why did he say that? No, it just it's, it's, it seemed like I'm in because I'm I'm happy happy with what I'm doing and this is uh, very great. nice. My, That's lovely. My, my, my best moment was uh, I think it was back in 2013, and I was invited to South Africa to give the speech at something called the Netterberg auction. Okay. The Netterberg auction. Netterberg is a winery yeah. in Stellenbosch, and the uh, they have an auction once a year, and they they choose older vintages from the best of the South African wineries. And people come in, the idea is that um, most people never have a chance to taste an older vintage. So they curate these things and, and auction them off to, uh, 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 to retailers and distributors and so forth from around the world. And so it gets, gets the best of, uh, news of uh, South African wine out where people can taste it and appreciate it. And every year they have one speech. And so I, I got to, to give the speech. And, nice. And, uh, it was interesting because I was so darn nervous. I, you know, I was trying to learn everything I could about South Africa and its wine, and that. And when I, I got to the end of the speech, according to wine enthusiast, which uh, sent a reporter to cover it, it oh. said that the people stood up and cheered. Oh, isn't and, that great? And, and the th I think the thing they loved is that I wasn't telling them, you know, this is what you need to do to be so. Uh, that at the end of it, I suggested to them that um, that their wines were great and they were really great and they are. Um, but, and and that what they needed to do to try to draw in the rest of the world mm -hmm. for their wines is to do what they do best, which is something called a braai. Have you ever right. been to a braai? That's a South African, is it a barbecue it's or? A barbecue, yeah. Okay. It is, it is the, the uniting force in South Africa that, that uh, black and white and uh, Indian and indigenous and everybody in South Africa gets together to enjoy a braai. Uh, their national day of unity is actually called Bride Day. Ah. This and and the idea that I think the idea that I would be saying that um, the thing that brings you together is the thing that can help propel you, uh, because there are brides that go with white wines and brides that go with red wines. And everyone likes a barbecue or a bride. So anyway, so uh, it was a it was a 
a moving moment. I was really moved by that. Oh, that is. Yeah, you remember that. You remember the things that touch you deeply, that you feel deeply. Um, Brian, it also reminds me of the Argentine equivalent of asado. I, right. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, very cool. Wow, the, the comments are pouring in, folks. Thank you so much. Post again. I can only see five comments at a time, then they disappear. So I'm not ignoring you. Post it again if I miss you. Um, Greg, Greg says, oh, nice, Lori. Uh, oh, he's complimenting on her on her wine choice. I love when they talk together. <laughs> Paul Hollander from Virginia. Patty and I are having a glass of Campus Oak Cabernet from Lodi. Jim Clark, price affects my uh, perception of wine more so, affects my expectation of wine more than my perception. I like that, it, my expectation of wine more than my perception. However, after having shelled out for it, I'm more likely to cut it more slack uh, if, if uh, determining if it meets my expectations. I really should be wearing my reading glasses, so I'm just too vain not to on video. Um, Marie Johnson, um, having the pol Penfolds Bin 138 with roast. Mm, excellent. Murray, yeah. we're coming over. All right. So fantastic. Um, so Mike, let's, uh, let's go now to maybe perhaps the most memorable thing someone has said about your writing. I think you've, you've said something already that was really interesting, but is there anything else you wanted to add to that? Because I know oh, you've won um, lots of awards. No, no, there. Um, I, I think uh, once again, it's 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 a moving thing. Um, there's a um, uh, a winemaker in uh, the south of France named Caro Feely, and she she uh, runs a wine school, and she and her family have a vineyard, and, and she writes books about her experiences. Her newest one is called A Glass Half Full, and it's I think it's just come out. Anyway, so. Um, she a few years ago asked me to write a book blurb for one of her books, a little yeah. endorsement on the back of the cover. So I asked her to write one for um, Money, Taste, and Wine. It's complicated. And so uh, she sent me the blurb, and, and in the blurb she said that she laughed out loud at some of the things I said. And that, that, That's always good. And, but then in the text the, of the email that went along with it, she said it also made her cry. Oh. It, and it made her cry because... Uh, although she's uh, living in France, she's originally, it's a South Africa connection, she's originally from the Klein Karoo, uh, this, uh, this wonderful kind of remote area of South Africa. And in fact, Money, Taste and Wine ends in, in uh, the Klein Karoo with uh, Sue and I in the back of a pickup truck going to a braai uh, with the stars above us and everything. Oh. And, and she said that that um, my my description of that journey at the end of the book uh, made her so homesick that oh. she's gonna cry, and of course that, again that that touches me because to, to think that I might be able to connect with someone that way that that closely is uh, is, uh, is very sad. You've already painted a picture too in the back of a pickup truck and the stars and everything else. That's, oh, that's no, it's, uh, it's being yeah. there. It's taking us there with that that imagery. That's 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 just lovely. Um, all right. Uh, so let's let's chat about your books. Let's. Um, would you like to start with your most recent one, Mike? Oh sure. So this okay. is this is a, around the world. world. 80 wines. 80 wines. Excellent. Hold it close to your camera there. And I've got a screenshot of it anyway that I'll put up here. Excellent. So this is, um, so we know Around the World in 80 Days, um, classic book. So what is your take on this? What's the concept? What What's the organizing principle, if you will? So I'm, for the longest time, I have been fascinated by books that take the reader on a journey. Yep. Because although the the uh, the idea of, of this is, is that you're following the author through this and discovering something about the world, it seems to me that you're always really interested in finding out something about yourself. And, and I've yeah. got a I've got around the world in eighty days and Gulliver's Travels and and uh, Jonathan Rabin's Old Glory and and Mark Twain's travel books. They're all around here. And I'm just fascinated. And, and at one point, I began to realize that Sue and I. We're on a journey of our own too, and we were discovering things about the wine world and things about. So I, um, fascinated, inspired by Jules Verne, I decided to yeah. to take his journey and to see to, to what extent uh, uh, the journey that we've been taking uh, mapped up on it. So, that, for example, his uh, journey begins in London at a place called the Reform Club. Huh. So our journey begins in London, three blocks away. 
at a wine shop called Berry Brothers and Rudd. Oh, that's famous in that's London. Famous. Yeah. yeah. He's been selling wine for 400 years and so forth. And so that's the start and the end point. And it follows him, uh, follows uh, Phileas Fogg, the Jules Verne hero, through uh, Italy, to, through, through France and Italy. But then, then life gets complicated. Uh, uh, Phileas Fogg has to get to as, as fast as he can around the world. And, and I'm more interested in accumulating stories. And this is maybe the, 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 uh, the big difference is that um, around the world in 80 days is, was uh, designed to be this story of um, man versus, and men and technology versus nature and distance. And the idea that, uh, that someone could overcome the challenges of, of moving quickly around the world, a technological problem. Uh, for me, um, I made me sort of stop and think, what is it I'm trying to find out about, about wine in the world? And I, I, I it just ended up on the question of, of why wine? Why is wine so important? Why, why does wine motivate and excite and inspire people around the world? Mm -hmm. so doing this, I don't have to cover distance. I have to accumulate stories that reveal some truth about the importance and significance of wine and the people, to their communities, to their families, to the world. Oh, I love the concept. I love that following the footsteps of a, a classic journey, a, a classic novel. It's, it's fantastic. Um, what a great organizing principle, because you do need that to hold together the narrative. Um, Beverly asks, um, oh, so before I get to Beverly's question, Elaine Bruce, is saying, I am loving all of this. Yes, Elaine, excellent. You should stay tuned till the end of this, Elaine. Um, Beverly says, how long did it take you to write this book? Oh, the, it, it, took a, it took a little over a year to actually um, get the writing of the book done. Okay. But part of that is that uh, as we travel, I record a lot of, um, of my thoughts and so forth on my blog, The Wine Economist. It's at wineeconomist.com. It, uh, the Wine Economist started off as a way for me to have this exchange with people to, so that I could try out ideas, um, instead of trying out ideas in academic papers, trying out ideas um, out uh, in the open so that people could criticize them, make suggestions and so forth. So, so that uh, uh, a, a lot of the writing uh, of the uh, ideas had been developed. And then it's a matter of sitting down uh, and that, that painful process of actually getting getting words on a screen. Yes, absolutely. So you, you treated l your blog or your website, thewineeconomist.com, almost like a peer review site, the way exactly. academics would s contribute and say, okay, you need to look at this, refine this, this question is unanswered. That's fantastic that you... Uh, it works really well because uh, if I've got a good idea, I, I learn about it. If I've got an okay idea, people improvement. If, as often happens, I have a terrible idea, I find out about that pretty fast. Too. Very quickly, yes, as do I. <laughs> I have a group that I call Wine Lovers for Better Grammar, and they will tell me every time I've got a dangling participle or a comma misplaced, there's a raging debate about the Oxford comma. Anyway, that's going down a rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, Lori asks, what in, in your opinion, Mike, is the best value wine? That's a... Uh, Big question, I'm sure there's many answers, but where would you point us to as a wine economist for the best wine values these days? Mm, okay, so um, best, well, there are great wine values from a lot of places. It's a matter of, a matter of, of searching them out and uh, increasingly looking, looking where, where you're not expecting them. But I mean, the, 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 um, uh, the wines from Chile, for example, red wines from Chile, have a have a reputation for very good value. It's uh, it's in fact a kind of a, as I, I talk about in the book. It's it's almost a curse because they would like to be known the Chileans. They'd like it to be known for great wines and great values. And people tend to think of them as great values. Mm -hmm. you know, with, um, the South African wines, uh, some of the yeah. not that many in the market. But some of them are sort of stunningly delicious for the price that you would pay. Absolutely. I've come across some recently, Mike, that tastes like almost like a Bordeaux. Uh, you know, it's and I've been recommending them. They're like 25 bucks and they taste like a 
like a even a second, third growth Bordeaux. It's like wow, and many of them have had their tutelage in Bordeaux. It's it's unbelievable the value coming out of there and the refinement, and yet it's a South African signature that's, that's on right. the wine. And let me let me put in a plug for Washington State wines. Yes, please. Yeah, because Washington State, um, uh, there there is a reason why. California wine wineries are now investing more in Washington because they can make wines that will remind you of a Napa Valley wine, but at half or a third of the price. Right, absolutely. And right to that point, Mike, um, uh, oh, I want to welcome Nicole Lougheed, who joins us, I agree re regarding Chile as a great value region. I'm currently drinking Max Reserva Cabernet Sauvignon, great <laughs> wine, excellent wine. Um, Neil Phillips from Toronto says, um, depends on what you consider value. I guess we're getting into definitions now, um, as we will on any discussion like this, but how would you describe a value wine, Mike? Oh, well, I have a colleague, uh, Pierre Lee, he's, uh, he's French. And when he and his wife, uh, Cynthia Hausen, go a uh, wine tasting at, at events with me, uh, they will, uh, here's, here's what they do. They, they go around and then they uh, taste the wine and, and they don't write down uh, 89 points or, or think, they write down how much they would be willing to pay for it. I love that. And then they look to see, and if if the price is less than what they had thought they'd be willing to pay, uh, so I call it the "is it worth it" index. I love that. That's brilliant. Awesome. I'm going to do that from now on. How much <laughs> would I pay for this? Excellent. I Dave, know there's, oh. There are sometimes when even though the price is very high, you taste that wine and you think, "Wow, this is priceless." Exactly, exactly. And people are always looking for that. They do the QPR, the quality price ratio. And there was even a site, I don't know if it's, it still exists, that does that. And they take, for quality, they take the score, which is an approximation and, and relate it to the price. But I love that concept of how much would I pay for this? Yeah. I love that. I love yeah. it. Um, Dave Head is drinking red line from Washington State with his lamb tonight. Dave Ooh. is on trend. You are right yeah. on trend. Yeah. Uh, Elaine Bruce is uh, asking Bordeaux left or right for the value? Left bank or right value? R right bank, sorry, for the value? I'm the wrong guy to ask. Right. Well, so am I, because Bordeaux is all overpriced to me, but maybe the bourgeois or lower crew estates will offer you value, Elaine. Uh, Spain, excellent. Yes, I agree, Elaine. Oh, yeah. Absolutely right. Absolutely. And some nice Portuguese wines. Yep, Portuguese. And because we have one of these hangover perceptions that it's all port and dessert wine, but they're making some terrific dry table wines. So again, the value is there. Neil Phillips says some BC Syrah is astounding for the price. Yes. And oh, that's Dave, right. One yeah. of the eighty wines is a BC Syrah. One of the what wines, sorry? One of the eighty wines. One of uh, the wines. Oh, in there. Yes. Yeah. Which one is that? that it's you the mentioned? CC Gents. Oh, yes, yes. And yeah, you have a number of Canadian wines in there. You mentioned Cave Spring, Sand Hill. And then uh, Monolus. The T yes. Ah, the tunnelist old vines. Tunnelist. Yeah. Right. And they make terrific Riesling. Okay. <laughs> Elaine says you have a high QPV. Okay, good. <laughs> We're getting evaluated here tonight on our discussion, but that's Come great. I'm, I'm glad. Okay. Wow. The comments are coming in. So interesting. We're going to our annual big cab tasting, says Paul, and we'll use the concept for our purchases. Thank you, Mike. I oh. love that idea. Oh. Very good value add here. Uh, Jim Clark says, my issue with price is that some boutique wineries set themselves up with high capital investment, then, but then only have planned a small yield for which they expect to make back their cost plus profit. So any comment on that? Like the, the whole boutique wines? I mean, maybe well, it's just a yes or no. <laughs> what, what, what we say in my, my part of the business is that uh, um, what is someone, do you know what someone does if they have more money than they know what to do with, but not enough to buy a baseball team? Ah, they start a winery? Here we go. There we go. And that's not- I like that. I no, like and I have that. to be careful with that because I have friends that have started wineries. Yeah. And I actually have a friend 
who, who owns part of a baseball team. So I, when I tell this joke, <laughs> I to a lot of a lot of people. But but it, it um, part of it is that this it comes down to a matter of values. That uh, um, when 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 someone starts a boutique winery, you know they've got their heart and soul into it and, uh, and everything, and 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 so they. Uh, they want to be validated. They want to have their yeah. decision to do this validated, and, and setting a high price because people confuse price with value, yes. price with quality. Setting a high price is maybe something that they have to do for the economics, but more often I think it's something that they want to do because they want to have the status uh, that is associated with it. And right. More the ego about the idea that price and quality are the same. Yeah. Then, then we wouldn't have that problem as much. Absolutely. Well, if ego didn't get in the way of a lot of things, we wouldn't have so many problems. But that's okay. We're not here to solve all of those. We're just here to talk about the wine world. So if you're just joining us, folks, um, you're here on the Sunday Sipper Club. If you're enjoying this conversation, please take a moment to share it. Add a comment as you do share because um, we will be drawing for next week. If you're watching the video replay, you still have a chance to do this for a personally signed copy of one of Mike Vsets book who joins us tonight, The Wine Economist at thewineeconomist.com. At the end of this session, I'm going to be announcing the winner of last week's contest, a personally signed copy of Vikram Vidge's cookbook. You'll Ooh. also want to follow us, yes, and uh, to get notified when we go live every time. All right, so back to some more comments. Huge fan of that uh, wine Mike, few in the cellar in Ontario, Creekside Broken Press Syrah, tastes double the price. Um, that's, that's Neil, Stephen Andrews. Oh, you just disappeared your comment. They're going too fast now for me to keep up with this. Okay. Um, Stephen Andrews. Yeah. You're talking about John Howard's megalomaniac winery. That would be an interesting thing. And, um, okay. So Mike, let's get back to your books. What is there anything else you want to tell us about Around the World in 80 Wines? It's your newest book. We can talk about some of your other books, but is there something else you want to say about that one before we sort of talk about the other ones? Well, it's just that it, for me, the, the, it, it uh, is an account of uh, what is really quite a, uh, it seems to me, a fascinating journey and an opportunity to think about all the different ways that, that wines uh, um, are. Uh, affect people and affect the world all around the world. And, and uh, uh, I will say that uh, this is a teaser for your your viewers here, that in Around the World in 80 Days, Jules Verne has a surprised ending twist because he arrives in London and he thinks he's lost. Oh. And to discover that uh, through some twist of fate, he has not lost at all. And so, so inspired by that, uh, uh, around the world in 80 wines also has a su surprise twist, which uh, I provided not only to, to uh, imitate Jules Verne, but also to make it possible for every reader, no matter what their wine taste would be, to come away satisfied with the conclusion. So, so oh, I love that. You read the book, take a look, wait for that, wait for it, as they say. So to begin again at the beginning and to know that place for the first time, that's Lord Alfred Tennyson. But, you know, to, to journey through our senses, through the world of wine, this sounds like this is your book. And then to come back again, more knowledgeable, and yet to know that, that sensory experience for the first time. I, oh, I need to dig into that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, so Murray Johnson says, I have had a lot of new world wines that I can't afford old, I can't afford or old world wines. So is that happening generally, do you think, Mike, that old world wines are becoming more inaccessible to more of us? Well, no, because, it, you know, if you look at Bordeaux, for example, yeah, uh, everybody looks at the first growths and the second growths and the, the famous classified growth Bordeaux. And, and sure enough, those are very expensive. And uh, I'm, uh, I don't drink those but once or twice a year. Uh, uh, because I have friends that like to share, share those quarts of wine. But, but in fact, you know, um, Bordeaux has 3,000 wine producers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so there's, there are, are different grounds. And, and uh, it seems to me, looking at, for example, the sales uh, patterns at Costco, Costco has begun to sell more 
of the um, affordable Bordeaux that are now being produced in a more um, accessible style. Okay. And I, I, so I think that the winemakers in the old world recognize that the market for the very best wines is limited, and it's not even a drinking market. It's mostly a collecting sort collecting of market. Collecting versus and, and drinking. People, people are trying to, to uh, people compete, people, uh, winemakers in the old world. So it's a matter of looking for these uh, things and looking to reviewers like you and others to help guide them because there's the 3,000 producers, what do you know? How do you know what, what to drink? But so don't give up. Is no, my never, never give up. <laughs> Keep going. That's a that's a great uh, encouragement. Um, Lori says, "What is Mike's opinion on expensive wines? Are the prices based on wine reputation, not necessarily the wine itself?" So we touched on that a little bit. Anything you want to add to that, Mike? Well, uh, many of the studies. You know, some people think, "Well, it, it must cost so much more to make." Than a, than a less expensive wine, and that's why it's so expensive. And and uh, really good wines are, are really the highest quality do cost more to make, but but not so much. The the, the price is based on what people will pay um, yeah. more than anything else. And so um, you know it's and, and that if if you're not if it's screaming eagle, I'm not that person who's going to pay the eight hundred dollars. Right. You're not the customer. <laughs> just, you know, it's not, not mispriced. Guy. You're just not the customer. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay. Wow. Oh, there's so many great questions coming in so quickly. One is wonderful. What else is there that has the artistry, history, and complexity? Agreed, Elaine. Um, Stephen Andrew says, your book sounds great. I am traveling to discover great wines at good prices that we do not get at home. Lots of fun if you can do it. And Stephen is always traveling the world. He's always logging in from somewhere different. Um, Greg Hughes, there is also... There's also a region that is cursed, like Chile, oh, Duro. Oh, you mean in the past had a bad reputation. Vinito, Campania, Beaujolais come to mind. All old world. Yeah, people that had to, re or regions that had to recover from something. I think even of Germany and the sweet wines, you know, and so on. So how does that Beaujolais impact? Got, Beaujolais was typecast for Nouveau. Yes. For the longest time, the, the, uh, so many people, uh, so many young people, especially, have never tried a Cru Beaujolais. Yeah. Those are really wonderful wines and affordable, too. Yes. And entirely different from the Nouveau. Like, exactly. people confuse them and think all Beaujolais must be consumed within six weeks of release, but it's not true. There's ageable Beaujolais that's released um, more cl closer to Easter or April, March time frame is when that comes out. So, so in, in, a, in Around the World for 80 Wines, I talk yes. about Beaujolais and Nouveau, and I call Nouveau a Black Friday wine. Oh, how timely. Why no, Why because, Black Friday? Because it's a well, discounted? Know, in, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's in Canada too. Black yeah. Friday is the, the day that if uh, a retailer uh, can sell enough, they'll be in the black for the whole year. It's true. If, if they can't sell enough, well, they're, they're going to go they'll be in the red. And and for the longest time, Beaujolais Nouveau was that Black Friday wine. That, uh, for, at one point, more than half of all Beaujolais wines were Nouveau. Oh. And if they could sell all of those, and often they sold them at a higher price than the Cru Beaujolais wines, oh, wow. sell all of those, they'd be in the black for the whole year. It's definitely a cash flow crop. Yeah, at Chateau cash flow, exactly, yeah. Ah, I like that. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so uh, some of your books, well, all of them actually, have intriguing titles. Money, Taste, and Wine. It's complicated. What was the concept of that one versus Around the World? It, there you go. There love you the go. title, love the, the concept. What? Um, so it, this began uh, with the idea that um, uh, that uh, that, that an economist might be able to talk a little bit to consumers about how an economist would buy wine if an economist thought about it a little bit. And so, <laughs> for example, the very first chapter is called The Wine Drinker's Biggest Mistake. Ah. You know what that is. Tell us. It's mistaken <laughs> price and quality. Ah, okay, all right, there you go. And so I, I, I talk a little bit in, in here about some of the research about how that's the case and why that's the case and, and, and how it can lead to all sorts of errors. I, um, I point out that, uh, that people, I have friends that when they go to the supermarket to buy wine, what they look for are what are called shelf 
shelf talkers. Those, yep, those, those down. slips with the points on them. That's it. And sometimes they have points, but I have friends that what they look for is the biggest markdown. You know, twenty dollars, but you pay only twelve dollars or something like that. And so that they they look at the top number and they say, wow, that must be a really good wine. And then look at the bottom number and they say, ah, okay. So I'm, but uh, you know, if they sold, if you found a car like that, if you were looking for a used uh, a used car and it said regularly twenty thousand dollars, but for you only twelve thousand, you would say, what's wrong with it? <laughs> yeah. That's right? true. But I have friends that when they see that, it's like a trout going after a, a lure, and they, they just <laughs> stop themselves from, from doing that. And part of it, uh, you had um, uh, one of your uh, uh, commenters earlier on said that they they uh, they use the price, maybe the price informs them on what to expect. And yes. some of the research uh, suggests is that when you see a price, well, the, that your brain, first of all, is always way too busy. You're always multitasking in that. It's always looking for shortcuts. And so when it sees a price, then it knows that the higher price ought to be justified by higher quality so that it, it begins to program in uh, an expectation of higher quality. And when they did these awful, um, I, I say awful only because I would hate to be one, these awful uh, MRI studies where they... Yeah put consumers in an MRI and they put a tube in their mouth and feed them wine and they tell them stuff. Yes. And when they, when they told them that it was, they took the same wine. And when they told them it was like a $12 wine, they're the little part of the brain that shows happiness glowed a little bit. But then a little later when they told them it was a hundred dollar wine, same wine, you know, it's like they were really, they were, they not only thought they were happy, but they were actually happy. Yeah, actually <laughs> were. <laughs> At least I, chemically. <laughs> turns out money does actually buy happiness uh, in a very limited sense. Awesome. Yeah. So why do we fall for this sale deal thing in wine and not on cars? Why don't we look at the wine that's on sale and go, what's wrong with that wine? Or do we? Well, I, th I think I, there are consumers that respond in different ways uh, to okay. all of this, um, for example. But um, I, think, I think part of it is that uh, in other things, many other things that we buy, uh, we have experience with them, or we we, we we know about them. But you know, you're in a supermarket. There are two thousand different wines, and you don't really know what's in that bottle. Or even if it's a, a, a sometimes if it's a fine wine, you don't really know that vintage very well. And so you're you're working in the dark more than you are in a lot of other consumer goods. And so that means that all of this little bit of information is very influential. Yeah, that's and, true. But you've got to then overcome this idea that 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 price is price is giving you more information than it really is. Huh, that's great. I always say there's a reason we don't have orange juice critics, right? That's right. That's right. Or uh, you know, in my in the supermarkets around here, they'll often have a clerk that lurks around to help people make decisions. So a, a wine uh, steward. Yeah. So I think I, I point out that uh, they don't actually have milk stewards to help. No, you exactly. There's no one saying buy that cabbage versus that one. That's it. You'll yeah. be fine. <laughs> okay. So, so, um, money, taste, and wine started off as this, and then and it, it 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 talks about to help people guide people through how to think about buying wine in a restaurant or or how whether to invest in wine or so forth. And, and then in the later chapters, it's uh, begin to think of all the different places where. Uh, money and taste are involved, and uh, excuse me, wine, taste and wine were involved. Mm -hmm. Then you add money to it and it changes it. So. Money changes everything. Okay, it's Stephen common. Andrews says, yes, absolutely. Uh, says, in your opinion, Mike, do countries generally set trade barriers for their wines and Canada uses wine to raise taxes so our wine becomes overpriced? Wow, deep economics here compared to European countries. Any comment on that? Oh, the, the um, it, uh, in general, I would say that the uh, wine trade is relatively free among nations. There are, there are trade barriers and so forth, but um, uh, in, in the U.S. we have uh, taxes on imports from other countries, and, and Canada has. Uh, it, it, you in Canada, I've, I've been fortunate uh, to, uh, in I think it was 2015, I spoke to both the Ontario Wine Growers Association and the BC Wine Growers Association in the same year. Ah. You know, for you, um, it's it's the uh, regulations in the domestic market that right. are uh, the, the greatest barrier, it seems to me, from your wine Amen. industry, wine yeah. in general, um, growing and blossoming the way I would yeah. like. 
Exactly. Like the fact that we can get a California wine easier than here in Ontario than we can and a, a BC wine. BC wine, yeah. It's insane. It's yeah. a grassroots industry. Anyway, uh, that's, preaching that's to the converted. But it's, it's, it, it's also complicated. Yeah, yeah, it is. All right. Um, <laughs> Alan Cameron, if Mike were a wine, he'd be a 99. The Gretzky <laughs> of your guests. 100 is reserved for God, so you're not going to get that. But you've got a very high score tonight, Mike. They, do. no. they don't usually rate guests. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let us turn now. I can't believe how fast this has gone, which is a testament how in, to how interesting you are, Mike what I'm calling the lightning round. Okay. Um, all right, so these are a series of quick questions and short answers because we just love getting tips and advice as we come to the finish line here. So what is the best piece of a wine advice you've ever received, Mike? Oh, know thyself, trust thyself. Trust yeah. exactly. Okay, what's the one thing you are wrong about perhaps as it relates to wine? Oh, I think I've, I've been wrong about a lot of things. So, but but um, one thing that I think I was wrong about that a lot of other people were is cork closures. Ah. I, I think a dozen years ago, I kind of wrote off cork and I thought, well, you know, screw caps are getting better and, and the synthetics and so forth. But cork, the, the amount of research and, uh, and change that there has been done in order to improve cork closures now. They've even got a, a, something called a helix, a screw cork. Have you seen oh. this? No, oh. I haven't. Yeah, okay. Uh, Google helix cork. And it, okay. Uh, so it solves even that last problem. Now, um, uh, cork taint, even in less expensive corks, is virtually uh, eliminated in the world. And so huh. cork is back. And because it's a natural product, I'm glad that it's back. I have nothing against uh, the other things. but So I, I wrote off cork without knowing, without appreciating how much the cork producers would would uh, invest to resolve their errors and how much people love cork. I'm glad to hear that. I need to re-examine my own misperceptions or hangover perceptions of cork. Thank you for that. Uh, what's the most useful wine gadget you've ever come across? Oh, I, I'm not a big fan of gadgets. No? For me, okay. corkscrew is, is what we, but, but if, uh, a friend of mine earlier this year showed me some gizmo where you take a wine bottle and you put a thing in it and you put a carafe upside down and you flip it over oh. and it gurgles yeah. and you flip it back over and so the aerated wine goes back in the original bottle. And it's, oh. It wasn't very expensive and I could taste the difference. So, so, so cool. I, I've got a gadget. Okay, that's good. <laughs> if you could share a bottle of wine with any person outside of the wine world, living or dead, who would that be? Outside of the wine world? Hmm. Hmm. Oh, maybe oh. Mark Twain, because oh. he traveled to some of these places, or, or Jules Verne. Oh, Jules Verne, I yes. So much. I think that would be that, yeah. Hmm, excellent. If you could put up a billboard in downtown Toronto or Seattle, wherever, what would it say? Oh, well, if it's in Toronto, it's easy. Okay. Drink VQA wines. Oh, because all right. There's so many great uh, VQA wines in Ontario, and, and I'd, I'd love to see that, uh, that industry explode. Fantastic. And finally, what's the most interesting question you've ever been asked? Because I'm collecting them. Oh, the most interesting question I've ever been asked. Um, I guess it must be this one because it's a hard. <laughs> um, okay, so that's sort of circular, but that's fine. <laughs> okay. That's great. Okay, Mike, as we wrap up our conversation, is there anything we have not covered that you'd like to mention right now? Oh, I just want to say how much uh, I have enjoyed this and, and interacting. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading uh, when the program is over, reading the comments uh, if your viewers have have left. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mike, because we will, as they post their comments, you know, we'll, we'll, you and I will both dive in there and answer unanswered questions, comment and so on. That's part of the ongoing conversation that happens just not tonight, but you know, as the week goes on and that always makes it great for everyone who's here tonight. And so how can people best find you online? Well, you go to wineeconomist.com. Yep. Or write to me at mike at wineeconomist.com. Okay. Are you on Twitter as well? 
I'm on Twitter at, at Mike Visa. Excellent. Mike, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for all of the insider tips. Uh, there's just so many I'm going to take away and do myself from, you know, how much would I pay for this wine to look again at cork. Um, the whole gamut. It's been very valuable. Thank you so much for well, all you. of your insights. All right. So we'll say good night for now, but uh, we will be in touch again. You should be a repeat guest for sure. <laughs> okay. Bye for now, Mike. Okay. Bye-bye. All right, folks, we are back again here. Excellent. And I am just reading your comments. So as we come to the finish line, don't forget we're announcing a winner tonight. So stay tuned. Don't disappear yet. Please take a moment in the comments below to post the most interesting thing you learned tonight. Surprising tidbit, most interesting. Mine would be, you know, what would I price this wine at before I know the price? As well as take a look, another look at cork. Um, if you really loved this conversation, please share it now. It's okay, it's at the end, but that's fine. Because when you share it with your own peeps, um, they will watch the video replay, which is a good thing. And if you found this conversation valuable, share it, add a comment that always makes it even more valuable as a share versus just a straight share. And if you want to know every time we go live, that's Sundays at six, you'll get a little ting, which is unobtrusive, but it will remind you, hey, we're live again with a very interesting person. If you want to connect with me, here are all my social media links. All of these will take you to where I am on various social media channels. And finally, come on and join us over at my website. We have a newsletter and so on. Everything's good over there. Um, lots to see and do. Okay, folks, so drum roll, pre please. Um, the winner of last week's conversation with Vikram Vidge, Vikram Vidge, his um, personally signed cookbook from Vikram Vidge is... I have to have a sound effect. I haven't learned how to do sound effects on this video yet. Um, is Elaine Bruce, and she's here tonight, Elaine Bruce. So Elaine, you are getting a signed copy of Vikram Vidge's cookbook. So awesome. Folks, we have got a great lineup next week. We're going to have Janet Fletcher, who is talking about cheese and wine. She's an expert from San Francisco. The week after that, I'm very excited. We have a big time New York writer, Jay McInerney. You know, you might remember him from uh, Bright Lights, Big City. Is it that? I always get that confused. But he's also written wine books. And he's he's published uh, probably a dozen books by now. He's joining us. And then on the 17th, we'll have a live, uh, a live versus a dead, no, a live winemaker from Australia, Peter Lehman's winemaker, lead winemaker. Over Christmas, I'll take a little break, but I might be doing some impromptu uh, Facebooks. I just won't um, book a guest. And we'll start big time in the new year. So if you've got suggestions for guests, please post them below. I know I asked for this last week and I am paying attention to your comments. Who do you want to see? Who are the most interesting people in the wine world? Let's keep this conversation really interesting. Uh, post your suggestions for guests. They can be food experts, wine experts, sommeliers, winemakers, celebs who have an interest in wine, you know, it runs the gamut, as you've seen already from all of the guests we've had so far this year. This is the highlight of my week. So thank you again for joining me. And uh, yes, congrats to Elaine. <laughs> Excellent. Guys, thank you. Lori, Murray, Stephen, Paul, Neil. Excellent. Someone from the cork industry. Absolutely, Neil. Um, guys, thank you. I'm going to sign out for now, but uh, as always... I am always thinking ahead to our next conversation, so I will chat with you soon. Take care.